figure I'd introduce myself. My name's Tom Morris. I'm the coordinator, the regional coordinator for professional development at Northeast Sair. So Matthew's going to talk about cover crop planting dates and seeding rates. And Matthew is an agroecologist and assistant professor at Cornell University, but we'll try not to hold that against him that he works at Cornell. He works in the soil and crop sciences department or section as they call it there. And he really is uh, interested in ecological intensification and cover crops are definitely one way to do that. So Matthew, it's all yours. I'd like to hear more about cover crop seeding dates and seeding rates. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to just start off by uh, thanking Stephen Mursky and Jason and Dean for uh, inviting me down here. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I think this is uh, quite, quite the meeting to have uh, on cover crops. It's uh, yeah, really wonderful to see everyone together. Uh, I came down late last night and uh, I woke up this morning and I saw flowers, some forsythias, and I was amazed. I was like, oh, wow, this is great. You know, It's kind of like uh, coming down here at this time of year. It's a preview to what's in store in a couple weeks up by, uh, in Ithaca for us. So it's uh, great to be here. So I was asked to talk about cover crop seeding dates and seeding rates. And so for this, I'm going to share with you some uh, previous research on cereal rye in Pennsylvania and in Maryland. I'm going to tell you about some new research. So I'm going to show you some preliminary data uh, from uh, some work that we did on hairy vetch uh, throughout the Northeast. And so this is uh, some fresh new uh, results that you'll be looking at here. And then I want to spend some time talking about uh, what I do in, when I'm not doing research, and that's teaching. And I want to show you some, uh, uh, some data from uh, the class that I teach and where the students collected some data on seeding rates and seeding dates uh, with cover crops. So just to uh, make sure everybody understands that we are teaching students uh, about cover crops and soil health at Cornell and at other land grant universities. I feel like sometimes we, we get a bad rap and people say you don't do enough of this. Well here you can have an, an example of what we are doing. Okay. So why care about rates and dates? Well, I'd say that you know, rates and dates have a major impact on cover crop performance, all right? biomass production and ecosystem services. All right? They can drive what happens out in the field. If you don't have your rates and your dates right, you can wind up with some very poor performance. And so using optimal practices, you know, we can save farmers money and increase their satisfaction with cover crops. And this is going to be really important if the cover crop seed industry is going to progress and, and be successful. All right, if we can put together some good recommendations where farmers are happy with what they're doing, okay, and they feel that they're getting value out of the cover crops that they're planting and the money that they're spending on those cover crops. All right, so jumping into cereal rye seeding dates and rates, all right, I'd like to just show, show this map from Massachusetts. This is some work that was done at UMass showing the critical planting dates of cereal rye to ensure maximum potential uh, nitrogen accumulation. All right, and you can see throughout here, there's five different, five different zones in a small state like Massachusetts. All right. The goal here all right, is to grow a lot of biomass in the fall, all right, to suck up that nitrogen after corn. And what they found is that the dates, the optimal dates, are after, after typical corn, harvest, corn silage harvest in, in several of these regions, and that we're not getting the, the maximum biomass production, not cycling that, those nutrients that we could be cycling. And so I'd like to just point this out and show you that you know, the optimal dates in this case depend on the function. All right? If we were just trying to get some cover crops out there to hold the soil in place and prevent some erosion, you know, they might look different. And so what I'm going to be doing throughout this presentation is, is making a call for some more nuance in our recommendations and tying our recommendations for planting rates and dates to actual cover crop functions. We know that cover crops are multifunctional. right? And so we want to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how we're trying to manage these cover crops. In this case, we're trying to, to uh, prevent some nitrogen from leaching through the soil, and so we want to maximize that fall biomass production. Okay? So I, I've done a lot of work on organic no-till. Before uh, going to Cornell, I worked at Penn State, and before Penn State, I was at the Rodale Institute, and I was there with Dave Wilson and some other people, Jeff Moyer, when we really started working on organic no-till, this rolled cover crop system, and one of the experiments that I did for my, my uh, dissertation research was I looked at seeding rates 
of cereal rye, and I looked at uh, in, a, in a, an experiment with a factorial with uh, poultry litter applications. So there were three rye seeding dates, or seeding rates, excuse me, and then three fertility uh, poultry litter application rates. Right? This research was done in Pennsylvania and in Maryland in 2008 and 2009. And the question here was, does increasing soil fertility and rye seeding rate increase rye biomass production? We were so focused on rye biomass production because we're using that rye biomass as mulch and we want to suppress those weeds that are in those no-till crops that we're planting. And so having a lot of biomass is really important. All right, and the other question was, does the increased rye biomass improve weed suppression? Just making that link there. And so just to start off, just, just to uh, get right to the point here, you know, one of our results was that increasing soil fertility, all right, it increased biomass, but it did not improve weed suppression, okay? So again, just thinking about the function here, if we're going after, after weed suppression, we might be getting that biomass that we're looking for, but we're adding, we're adding nitrogen for those weeds to take advantage of. And so that really didn't work out. That was, that was a bit disappointing there. All right. But we, we did see a response with rye seeding rate. We did not see increased cover crop biomass, so the rye biomass, no significant difference between the three uh, rye biomass rates here, one and a half bushel, two and a half bushel, and three and a half bushel per acre. All right. But what we did see is decreased uh, weed biomass, so increased weed suppression related to rye seeding rates here. Right? So we didn't have the biomass, but we did have better ground cover. Okay? And that better ground cover, that resulted in reduction in weeds. So again, thinking about what you're trying to do with your cover crops, and you know, that can have an impact on how you go out and approach uh, your planting rates and your planting dates. So we see here, and I just want to point out that these data were pooled over all the three different, uh, you know, the three different fertility levels. And so I'm going to show you a lot of data, especially when we get to Harry Vetch. If there are any questions, if something just doesn't make any sense, please uh, stop me. This is a somewhat of an informal group here, so please uh, raise your hand or if you have any questions as we go through this, if I'm showing you data that doesn't quite make sense to you. Okay. So we all know that planting dates can have a big impact. We see here October 15th and September 15th, just the amount of ground cover in the cereal rye that was seeded here. Okay. And uh, these next slides, I'm going to show you some uh, research that was done by Stephen Mursky uh, when we were both at Penn State and looking at different uh, fall seeding dates for cereal rye ranging from August 25th to October 15th. And you can see that difference in just the ground cover. This, this picture was taken on April First, uh, all of this cereal rye was seeded at two and a half bushels per acre in seven and a half inch rows. And just based on this picture, you can, you can, you can just imagine, you know, the, the different performance, the different um, amount of either biomass um, or weed uh, suppression that you're getting when it's thin compared to when it's really thick, uh, soil protection. And so planting dates can have a really big impact here. Okay. When we look at uh, Termination, so this is the interaction between termination and seeding dates. You can see the different seeding dates lined up there on the x-axis. Again, ranging from uh, late August all right, to mid-October. This is cereal rye biomass on the y-axis. The first termination date, May 20th there, you can see the difference in the biomass production just based on the planting date. Okay. And then uh, when we look at the termination date, we see that you know, the delaying, the timing in the spring can actually have a, a more of an impact than timing in the fall. All right, so we want to keep that in mind. Delaying termination one day in the spring was equal to about seeding five days earlier in the fall. And I think it's really important that we start looking at these relationships, all right? Planting dates, uh, termination dates, planting rates, and understanding what type of uh, compensation there can be. If you're, if you're looking for biomass and you get your seed in a little bit late, well, you should be thinking about terminating a little bit late too. So more data, again, uh, from the this, this same trial here. And uh, you can see some of the main effects here in the crop. So three different uh, cover crops, a rustic rye, wheeler rye, and then rye and hairy vetch. And this is the mean biomass production. And then the six different planting dates in the fall. And uh, just to summarize 
what we were looking at in the previous slide and in these slides, you know, although the higher seeding rates in that previous trial with cereal rye did not increase cereal rye biomass, weed suppression was better. All right, that's what we were just looking at. And now this, with these six different planting dates and cereal rye in a separate different experiment, we saw that uh, this increased biomass, and of course when we we're talking about biomass, we're also talking about ecosystem services here. We were able to increase biomass by about 50% when planting cereal rye in early September compared to mid-October. Okay, so that's a huge impact there. Whenever you talk about planting dates of, of cover crops, you need to keep in mind crop rotation. What are your options? What can you do? All right, some people are looking at shorter season crops. You know, short season corn, you know, the yields tend to be uh, looking pretty good recently, okay? Um, you know, that might be an option. If you really want cover crops to drive, drive your system, you know, you have to, you might need to make some adjustments in your overall cropping system, including your, with your cash crops and your cash crop uh, maturities, okay? So just moving on here, again, 50% difference, all right, when we were going from uh, uh, seeding in early September compared to mid-October. And now I'm going to jump into some, uh, some hairy vetch. So someone, um, someone was talking about uh, cereal rye being the, the queen. You know, I, I wonder what the king is. Do, do people know what the, the cover crop king is? I would say, you know, hairy vetch is, is right up there in one of the top cover crops. I really like hairy vetch because of the amount of nitrogen that it can produce. It's winter hardiness. It grows really well. Uh, I, I do understand that some people consider hairy vetch to be a weed, all right? And I know some organic grain farmers that will not plant this, even though it can supply a tremendous amount of nitrogen. However, I really like it. I think uh, the people are doing some work to get around the hard seededness issue. Uh, Stephen Mursky and Steve Groff have looked at uh, scarification, looking at trying to uh, break that dormancy. And so I think we're going to see, or we should see, more hairy vetch work in the future. And I think we should be encouraging farmers to start looking at hairy vetch especially if we can get the, the potential hard seededness issue worked out either through breeding or through seed treatments, okay? So this is some preliminary work looking at hairy vetch seeding rates and seeding dates together in one experiment. This was a, a, a study, a research uh, experiment that was set up by Stephen Mursky, and uh, there's a number of different people that are involved in this research. So Chris Reberg Horton down at North Carolina State, Bill Curran at Penn State, John Spargo, who was at an university or at um, at Bark in Maryland, and then uh, Masood up in uh, UMass. All right, so we have this nice uh, latitudinal gradient. I was also doing this work at, at Cornell, and uh, we have a couple of people that are helping uh, write this up and uh, work on the, these data. So Victoria Ackroyd and and then Stephen Cordu or Stefan Cordu. All right, this is a picture of Stefan. He's a visiting scientist. Uh, from INRA in France. INRA is like the uh, USDA equivalent in France and he's been working on these data. But this is a, a case where we was, were spanning a latitudinal gradient from uh, USDA plant hardiness zone 5A all the way down to 8A. We have a number of different site years with, with this uh, data set. We were testing the effects of seeding rates and dates on biomass production. We grew corn after the hairy vetch in these plots to look at, at nitrogen uh, supply but I'm not going to show you any of those data. Today's just talking about biomass. And so, like I said, the five different states there, we drill seeded into a tilled seed bed at multiple rates, ranging from five to 45 pounds per acre. Okay, we all used the same seed. This was from Steve Groff, the Harry Vetch. Uh, it was all inoculated. And then we sampled the biomass at multiple times. All right, so there was a conventional and intermediate and a 50% flowering timing for the biomass uh, sampling. So this is just a picture of uh, one of the graduate students at Cornell. This is at the um, uh, at the conventional timing. So this is early pre-flowering uh, growth stage here, uh, May May 17th. You can see the veg, veg production. And then this is uh, across the different locations. Okay, so this is a, a box plot, and you can see the data and how they're spread out, uh, going from north, all right, north to south. Okay, from north to south. And so what you see here is uh, this just different range of biomass that was produced uh, when we pool over all of the different treatments, all right? So this is pooled over uh, the different rates and the different dates, and just looking at the effective location, all right? In the south, you can grow a lot more hairy vetch, all right? That's uh, pretty interesting. In the north, we have trouble with this, 
all right? Our growing season and what we can do. Our winters are harder, all right? It's just a little bit more challenging for, for hairy, hairy vetch production, all right? All right, but uh, biomass production increased with decreasing latitude, all right, as we went south, okay? Now I'm showing you the effect of seeding rate, okay? And what we did here, we, we, we plotted all the data and we're just drawing a line through the mean at these different seeding dates. All right, we're not fitting any models, just looking at the line, uh, the average, all right, for these different, um, different rates. And so we have the rate here, seeding rate. Uh, this is in kilograms per hectare. Apologies for people who are used to looking at pounds per acre. Uh, biomass in kilograms per hectare. And you can see there's some variation here, right? And so, again, this is pooled over the different uh, planting dates. But in general, we see uh, at some sites, we see an increase. All right, as we increase our seeding rate, uh, biomass production goes up. At other sites here, like North Carolina, it doesn't matter what you're seeding that hairy vetch at. All right, you go down to five pounds per acre, and you're getting good biomass production here. Okay? And so, now let's look at this. Let's, let's dissect this a little bit more. Now, these are the different site years. Um, so, the different years here now are represented uh, by these different colors. And again, a bit of variability. And then this is uh, where we just lay it all out, okay? The seeding rates, all right, are on the x-axis here. Biomass on the y-axis again. Different years, all right, 2011 to 2012, 2012 to 2013, and then 13 to 14 here. And this is, again, ranged from north to south, all right? So from Massachusetts down to North Carolina, all right? When you look at these data, all right, we start to see that effect all right, especially at the northern sites, that effect of seeding rate. Again, in North Carolina, all right, you, you put out a little bit of hairy vetch and you're maximizing your production there. So again, I think what we, what we need to do is start taking a more nuanced look at our seeding rates, all right? Start to take into account uh, some of the, the, the context, all right? Where you are, like the map, the five different zones in Massachusetts, all right, now this is across the whole Northeast, and I think we can get a lot better than just saying, oh, well, you should seed your hairy vetch at 30 pounds per acre. This is uh, a different way to look at some of these data. Now we're just focused on the planting date, all right? So planting day from September 1st here, all right? Now we have all of the different sites and site years. So a lot of data in this data set, all right? Average biomass production. And you can see this negative, this, uh, negative slope here. All right, just going from the first date to the second date. Some of these points up here, all right, there was only one date. All right, so we, we can't draw, draw a line and you can't see that, that trend. One of these uh, years here, this is when I first got up to Cornell. I was really ambitious and excited about this experiment. I kind of went all, all out. I wound up seeding Harry Vetch in November and I realized that it, that does not work. Um, you don't get a lot of biomass production there. All right, but this is again pooled over the, the different rates and just showing you that effect. And so when you're going out and you're, you're, you're losing you know, 1,000 thousand, uh, kilograms per hectare, all right, by delaying 20 days, you know, that's a big deal, all right? You know, that's, that's lost nitrogen for that next crop. And so, uh, you know, if we take it into account and, and think uh, about our, our dates and our management a little bit more, we can get more value out of our cover crops that we're using. We want to be, really, for the Northeast, we need to be in September, uh, especially up north in, in, uh, in uh, New York and Massachusetts, and we need to be more like late August than, uh, than September, okay? Whereas North Carolina, you know, they're fine in October. All right, so if we take a closer look at just the New York data, all right, we have uh, 2012, 2013, 2013, 2014 here, okay? These were the uh, two, um, two dates that we were really pushing the envelope with. All right, one in uh, October 17th. All right, that's that green one there. And then November 19th. And, uh, and I had this idea that we might be able to do some dormant seeding, all right? And not really expect a lot of fall biomass production, but when we put that out uh, in that particular year, it was very cold. The vetch did not come up before, um, before winter, before the snow set in. And uh, we just had very, very poor production. But you can see in some of these cases, and depending on the, the timing of the harvest, so this is conventional, you know, the timing, the intermediate timing, and then the flowering timing, so biomass production increasing, right? 
So as the season progresses, biomass increases. Okay, and the rate uh, is, is more important if we want to be harvesting uh, or uh, not harvesting, but either uh, plowing under or terminating that cover crop earlier. You know, that's when that rate is going to become more important. In this other site year uh, down here, we do, we do see a nice relationship uh, between the uh, seeding rates and that increased biomass production. And so this is just a mean, if, if, if you are not familiar with uh, looking at data like this, this is a, a generalized additive model. This is just a smooth line through here. And those, uh, those bands there are 95% confidence intervals. If we take a closer look at Maryland, again, at these uh, three different termination or sampling dates for conventional farmers and intermediate, and then for organic farmers that are doing some organic no-till when they're really targeting the flowering growth stage, you see in some cases, you know, again, rate doesn't matter. You have a little bit of vetch out there and you can wait long enough, you're going to maximize your biomass. But not every year. This is a case, uh, this is when I convinced Stephen Mursky that uh, we should try dormant seeding and he, he uh, went really far. He, he seeded in January uh, 30th. Um, I thought I was bad with November, but he, he went all out. And again, there we had very, very poor production. But I think we need to be pushing the envelope with some of this stuff. And I, I think uh, you know, what we're seeing, you know, we do see differences uh, across this latitudinal gradient. Again, you know, the rate being more important at earlier stages here. And if we uh, zoom back in on just one of the site years for, for New York, we are going to be um, fitting models to this, these data. Um, you can see when we draw lines through this, we can see uh, we can understand what the asymptote is and what the slopes are for these. And we can get a sense for are these different um, seeding, seeding rates and planting dates, are they really different from one another? Or is it just, uh, just a bit of variability there? And so we'll be doing this for all of the, uh, the different data sets that we have, all those different site years. Uh, this is uh, at a preliminary stage right now, so I don't have uh, the full worked up uh, results for you and, and recommendations based on this. But that's what we'll be doing over the next several months, looking at these data a bit more and uh, really digging into this and trying to understand what the trade-offs are and what type of uh, potential compensation can there be. If you are going to be planting late, if you know you can't get into your field because you have a crop there, okay, can you increase your seeding rate all right, and get you know, maximize that biomass production? Or alternatively, if you know you can get into your, your field earlier, if you can get in in August or in September, can you decrease that rate and save some money? All right? So that's what we're looking at with this, uh, this analysis and this uh, data set. Like I said, Harry Vetch, uh, seeding rate is more important in northern sites than when planting late. Okay. Also when trying to terminate earlier, um, that's another, another case when the seeding date is going to be very important. And for the next steps, we want to uh, further examine, examine uh, this relationship between seeding rates and seeding dates and look at that uh, compensatory effects. Uh, we want to determine what the uh, base temperature is for hairy vetch. Does anybody know what the base temperature is for calculating growing degree days for hairy vetch? Has anybody ever done that research? I, know, I think we all kind of assume that it's, it's going to be close to wheat but, uh, or cereal rye, but it's, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's actually done that research before, so we, wanna, we feel like this is a really nice data set to do that, to do some optimization modeling, to really nail that down, uh, determine what the base temperature is for growing degree days, and then model the uh, biomass production. And ideally, what we uh, would be doing with this data set is improving seeding date and rate uh, recommendations. And uh, hopefully creating a map across the Northeast, just like what you saw with Massachusetts. Uh, we'd be doing the same thing with Harry Vetch, but across the, the whole Northeast to give people a better sense of what type of flexibility there is. Get away from the 30 pounds per acre or a range, you know, 20 to 30. You know, let's get a little bit more precise with this. So now I want to just spend some time. Question over here? Yeah. I noticed on our farm that, uh, you know, if, if I plant in August, I might get a, I might get a little bit more biomass growth, but if I wait until like September 15th, yeah. I'll get less weed seed production. Yeah. So I, I, I always wait until, you know, a little bit later in the season to plant cover crops because yeah. I don't have to really fight the weeds. Have you, like, thought about doing that research? You know, weed seed, uh, I mean, uh, seeding rates, timing, and then layer on top of that, you know, weed seed production. In, in my experience, the, those little weeds, they're little annual weeds, they, they pop up um, around the same time as, as the cover crop would, and they, uh, they set seed too. 
Um, the thing is that they set only a small amount of seed. And so in my experience, I've, I've, uh, I've thought about those as being more of a nurse crop, um, really not impacting. If, if you do have a, a strong, thick, hairy vetch crop, there, you know, those annual weeds that are coming up in the, in the fall, they're not going to be there in the spring. If, you, if you're down in, in Maryland and you have winter annuals coming up, that's different. I'm talking about Pennsylvania and New York. So depending on where you're at, you know, the weed phenology, weed ecology, you know, can play a role and there can be differences there. Uh, we have not taken that into consideration with, with this work that we're trying to do across the different states here, but very interesting. Matthew, have you done any work interceding with Vetch and do you know, do you have a sense of if that's buying you any benefit from an earlier seeding rate or having it be under the canopy, do you not gain that much? So the work that we've done with uh, interceding uh, hairy Vetch in particular, it's always been in mixture and uh, and it's been in corn and it's been in a high nitrogen environment and so we've had grasses in there and the grasses have tended to outcompete the hairy vetch. Uh, red clover has done much better than hairy vetch in our inner seeding uh, research. You said that a higher seed weight in order why you got better weed control. Are you attributing that to the higher rate and higher population smothering weeds or are you talking in regards to allelop the allelopathic uh, properties attributed to rye? Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. Um, so I was talking about increased weed suppression at a higher rate, uh, irregardless of biomass production, right? And so standard, same biomass, but uh, lower weed biomass at that higher seeding rate. What we attribute that to is ground cover. We collected data on ground cover and light interception. And so what we're seeing is that a more complete ground cover, that sort of sets the stage. Uh, when weeds emerge, they can uh, sense there's um, really interesting research by Clarence Swanton up at uh, University of Guelph uh, showing that early shade avoidance responses and that, um, that weeds can actually sense their environment, their light environment as they're emerging or as they're deciding to emerge, if you will. Um, and that's what we're attributing uh, this increased uh, suppression to. So purely a light phenomenon here, not allelopathy and not biomass, not physical interference. So there's, there's some... Uh, work that's uh, been done that shows that we're on the right track with that, but I think there could be a lot more done to show um, what, what can be done and how we can utilize that more in the future. I was hoping that it, it was, we would focus on any uh, data problems or miscommunications, but um, I love the questions and, and uh, yeah, let's just keep going here. So rates and dates in the classroom. Um, when I teach about cover crops to students uh, at, at Cornell, I talk about different types of cover crops. You know, I, I introduce catch crops. Uh, green manures, some other crops, biofumigant crops, okay, and so this is uh, part of my standard uh, lecture on, on cover crops and, you know, and making sure that you know what you're, you want your cover crop to do and you select, you know, species selection based on that. And so we did a, an experiment. Uh, when I found out I was going to be doing uh, you know, this talk, I said, well, you know, we, I'm teaching uh, this semester. I have a, a lab section associated with this class. And so I'm going to do a little experiment so we can get some data so I can share with you uh, based on seeding uh, rates. And so what we did is you're seeing these students. Uh, one thing that you can see here, uh, this woman right here, uh, she has her cell phone out. Uh, this, is, um, this was uh, encouraged, okay, because she was using an app uh, to help her measure the cover crop uh, ground cover here. And so this is uh, Canopio. Uh, this is uh, for measuring fractional ground cover. If, how many people have seen this or used this before? Because I think this is like the coolest thing out there right now in terms of uh, what you can do with your, your cell phone, your smartphone. Uh, you can basically go out to a field and, and instead of estimating visual estimate of ground cover, you can just click a picture and it'll tell you how much ground cover you have. And I would love for us, you know, coming out of this meeting to think about uh, uh, creating a network where we can all feed data into a, a system where we're using Canopio and going out to our fields either this spring or in the fall or next year and contributing and creating uh, like a citizen science database. People do this all the time with other, other uh, disciplines, iBird for example. Uh, you know, people that like to do birding, you know, they have apps you can go out and say, all right, I saw this bird here, and it'll either um, you, you can get the coordinates, but it'll be entered into a database. And I would love for us to be thinking about doing that, especially with the Northeast Cover Crop Council, all right? But a little bit, uh, let me, I just went off on a tangent there, but let me uh, continue with the uh, classroom data collection. 
Uh, so we had four cover crop species that we were looking at, buckwheat, forage, radish, cereal rye, and red clover. And we looked at five seeding rates. All right, so this was, uh, we were working in six inch pots and we had one, three, nine, and 27 seeds per pot. Plus we included the recommended rate. And the recommended rate was from, from Andy from uh, managing cover crops profitably, thanks. <laughs> and so we seeded these three weeks before sampling in the greenhouse. Uh, we measured height, biomass, and then ground cover. And so this is what it looked like. Um, now, just bear with me, this is not a complete ground cover. This is a pot and it's on the floor. We did standardize the height that they were taking the measurements at, but you can see the difference um, in red clover here. We had one, three, nine, and 27 seeds per pot here. And so red clover, not a lot of ground cover, but with forage radish, all right, this is like the complete opposite. All right, a lot more ground cover and um, uh, the, just the uh, numbers were much higher uh, when the students collected the data with uh, forage radish and also with uh, buckwheat. So when we look at the data here, this is at, at three weeks after seeding, we have the seeding rate, all right, uh, seeds per pot here. And I'm just going to show you the standard uh, recommended seeding rate is right here in these larger um, uh, symbols here, okay? So the larger symbols, those are the recommended seeding rates. The, uh, based on some data that we grabbed online uh, for seed prices, we we're seeing that the seed prices for the recommended rate, uh, again, those large symbols are right there. So buckwheat, $64.54 uh, per acre. All right, 36 for forage radish, cereal rye, 60, and then red clover, all right? And so what we see here is that you know, the two broadleaves, you know, minus red clover, of course, but the two broadleaves, they uh, were able to cover that ground much, much faster and at a much higher rate than, um, uh, than uh, certainly cereal rye or red clover. And so thinking about this, if we really wanted to maximize uh, uh, shading here, for example, we could go up to here, you know, and we could go up here, and this is like that max rate, uh, 27 seeds per pot, and, and I don't think uh, people really want to spend um, $972 per acre on, on cover crops, but it'd be really interesting to know what people do, uh, what they are willing to spend, all right? And so we, uh, we actually asked uh, some, some farmers this question, how much are you willing to spend on cover crops? Okay, and, and so this is uh, really interesting. This is a survey, all right, a nationwide survey, uh, and the question was, how much we will, are you willing to spend on, on cover crops? All right, and we can see uh, we broke this into different bins here. So $10 to $25, $25 to $50, $50 to $75, and then over $75. And we broke this out by organic and conventional farmers. All right, we were really targeting organic farmers in this. That's why they're represented so high with these different numbers here. All right, so there are more organic farmers that re responded to this survey than conventional farmers, but that was intentional. Uh, what was really interesting here are the extremes, right? So conventional farmers, uh, you know, they're really looking for cheaper seed, all right? Really looking to uh, uh, watch their their investment there and how much they're spending on cover crop seed. Whereas the organic farmers, uh, farmers that are growing higher value crops, they may be willing to spend, you know, more than seventy-five dollars per per acre on cover crop seed. And I think that's that's something good to recognize. If depending on what function you're trying to get out of your cover crop and what the context is, you know, if it's a small, a small vegetable farm or, or a backyard gardener, all right, you, you can really uh, play around with these rates to, to uh, make sure that you get the function that you want to uh, and the benefits that you want to achieve from your cover crops by playing around with these uh, different seeding rates. So just to wrap things up here using, uh, you know, rates and dates as a tool, a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, the ability to um, manage services, ecosystem services, these benefits from cover crops uh, with seeding rates, it really depends on the, the type of cover crop, all right? So we were seeing that we had a, a really strong response with buckwheat to increasing seeding rate, very poor response with, uh, with red clover, for example. So, you know, a smother crop, you know, that you might be thinking uh, that a higher rate might be worth it if you really want to get good weed suppression. Uh, if you're using a smother cover crop. With catch crops, it may be different. Again, keeping the context in mind, uh, we need to consider economics. Like I was just saying, organic and conventional could be different. Commodity versus you know, high value crops. Right? Getting away from this one standard kind of recommendation 
I think will, will benefit us all. Uh, and if we can figure out ways to reduce it for farmers that are concerned about seed costs and figure out what we can actually do if we can increase it for farmers that are not as concerned about those seed costs. And then adaptive management. You know, Brandon was talking about adaptive management. And I think this is where, where we're going in the future. Um, you know, again, once we look at these uh, hairy vetch data that we have, we'll be able to understand you know, what type of flexibility there is. Uh, is there potential to reduce seeding rates when we're planting earlier, save money? And can we increase seeding rates uh, when we're planting late to make sure that we get that biomass that we need? I'm just going to uh, stop there. Uh, and say thank you. I appreciate your time. Just a take-home comment. Uh, I guess first and foremost, plan ahead for anybody that's thinking about doing cover crops and uh, think about getting your seed, getting it ordered, because uh, a lot of people I've talked with that start thinking about a cover crop too late in the season, all of a sudden can't find out they can't get the seed they want. Yeah, another thing that I'd like to say is, is you know, when we're planning on dates, um, what we're seeing with more extreme weather events, you know, we need to have more flexibility built into our, our plans. And so if we get locked out of the field, um, we need to know, you know, how late can we plant? And if we do plant that late, you know, what, what rate should we go at? So again, you know, having contingency plans. If we can't get the seed that we want or if it, we, weather locks us out, that's really a big deal there. I was just going to say that sometimes in August when we don't want to necessarily put the seed in, we do a bare fallow and that kind of knocks the the uh, weeds back a little bit until we do finally get the cover crop in. And bare fallows work pretty good for us in certain times. But another question about, you know, you're growing uh, vetch to the maximum biomass. I mean, I don't know about any other farmers, but trying to mow down a maximum biomass vetch is like <laughs> trying to get a, you know, it's like a spider's web that you can't even attack it unless you have a very specialized uh, flail mower that can, you know, go more than two miles an hour. I mean, there's a there's a <laughs> there's a limiting factor. Just how how do you how do you accommodate getting rid of vetch that's you know that much biomass? It's a it's a problem. Yeah, well, I'd say uh, cereal rye is probably worse. So uh, um, yeah, of course, we need to keep in mind what we're what we're trying to do with the cover crop, how we're going to manage it. Um, maybe biomass isn't isn't the goal, uh, but certainly for organic no-till. Having a lot of biomass, as long as you can plant through it, that's going to serve as your weed suppression. Do you find so. there's some advantage to rye? I've always put rye in with vetch to try to get the, the height of the rye, pushing and getting better sunlight on, onto the rye. I mean, is, isn't there some uh, research that's been done with the, the, the accumulative effect of the two we work together? I would think that's always seemed a better bet for me to have a little bit of both together, like a 20 yeah. percent. Uh, vetch with a you know 60 you know rye or something like that so so that is a great segue to our next uh, presentation okay. uh, about mixtures uh, you know but but seriously uh, you know rye and vetch they they can perform well together they they uh, serve complementary functions uh, with our organic no-till and that's uh, where I've done a lot of my research uh, we don't want that extra nitrogen in with our soybean part of the weed suppression that we get is from low soil nitrogen from soil t uh, nitrogen tie up and immobilization with that rye so if we're adding vetch, all we're doing is decreasing that competitive ability of the soybean relative to the weeds. And so we don't really want the vetch there. And with, uh, when we're going into rolled rye or, or rolled rye vetch for, for corn, um, you know, we want all that nitrogen. So when you're increasing the carbon nitrogen ratio by putting in rye there, um, you're just making uh, the nitrogen less available to that corn crop. So I'm sure uh, in some cases that uh, rye vetch mixture is going to be beneficial, but at least in, in my work, um, uh, we've been better off with going with single species uh, plantings. Mm -hmm.